Joining us on the WBGO Journal is one of the leading interpreters of classic swing and stride piano. Grammy-nominated pianist, host of Jazz Inspired, and author of the new book, Great Inspirations, 22 Years of Jazz Inspired on NPR, the wonderful Judy Carmichael. What an honor it is to speak with you today. Aw, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here, Doug. See, that smile is what it's all about. You know, one of the (laughs) testimonials, I love to laugh, Judy, and one of the testimonials in your book comes from WBGO's editorial content producer and former editor and publisher of Jazz Times, Lee Mergner, who says the only thing missing from great inspirations is Judy's laugh. He says, (laughs) you'll have to imagine it for yourself. And I think laughter is one of the big keys when it comes to doing a great interview. And you obviously enjoy these wonderful chats that you've had with stars from all walks of life, haven't you? Oh, it's fantastic. I don't understand why people don't laugh. I mean, it, I feel bad for people without a sense of humor. And that's, we're talking about creativity and inspiration and on my show. And people get very emotional both ways, laughing and tearing up. And uh, I I do, I, I, I hurt for people who can't access that. I think our styles for our, both our podcasts, I have a sports podcast and you have, you know, a music oriented, but it's both, they're not really about music and not really about sports. They're about life. And that's where you get the emotion from everybody. So, you know, I love your work and uh, it, it, you know, it inspires me as well. Now playing ragtime piano at Disneyland's Coke Corner taught you a lot and about (laughs) really taught you about how people react to music from all different ages. Can you just tell us a little bit about your early experience at Disneyland? I played usually five days a week, seven hours a day. That's a lot of solo piano. And it's a lot of time to not only develop your music, but to look inward. And I've talked to a lot of soloists that, in fact, Hank Jones and I used to laugh about this, that you have worked out everything because you're sitting there, you're playing And after a while, you even can't stand your own playing. You've just done everything you can do. So one of the great things that I did at Disneyland, and I wrote about it in Great Inspirations, was I saw so many people. And that that kept me interested, not only interacting with these people, but just observing them. And people would come by, and they always had their kids with, obviously. And some would really get into the joy of the music and the atmosphere, and others would just say, see, if you practice, you could be like her. And I was just like, oh, my God, there's another kid who's going to hate taking piano lessons. So I would see that because I would get to see so many people. And I learned a lot and, and met lots of musicians. It was a great experience for me. I was so fortunate to have that job. Five years, five years. It kind of reminded me of, you know, Piano Man, Billy Joel, who's in your in your book here as one of your interviewees. You know, what are you doing here? You know, hey, man, put bread in my jar. You know, what are you doing here? And, and people had the same reaction. Why, why are you in New York City? <laughs> people say the most amazing things. And it was one of the things that I grew up in Los Angeles. And so it was one of the things that really drew me to New York because with meeting all these people at Disneyland, New Yorkers invariably liked me and hated Disneyland. They, you know, I'm sitting there in a turn of the century costume playing ragtime. And they'd say, you're great. What are you doing here? You should be in New York. It was just like, there was this directness that I loved. And and I love Los Angeles, but there's a lot of that showbiz, even in the culture of everybody's nice. I always say you go to a restaurant and everybody's, hi, my name's Judy, I'm your server. And so there's all of that to where the first time I was in a deli in New York and I was in my twenties, the guy looked at me and I'm very thin. And he said, and I ordered, I didn't know what a deli would give you. There was a huge sandwich, all this food. And he looked at me, he goes, why'd you order that? You can't eat all that food. I thought, I love New York. (laughs) So honest. So honest. Well, fortunately, your waistline doesn't look like mine. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And that all the food that you enjoy 
uh, hasn't resulted in that. But you created Jazz Inspired in 1998 without the support of a radio station, without the support of a network, before podcasts were the ultimate craze. That had to be difficult. Tell us about that journey. It was very difficult. It was kind of crazy. It was, in fact, I didn't even think about the fact Leonard Malton told me that. He introduced me to someone. He said, Judy had a podcast before podcast existed. And I, believe it or not, the first person who told me I should have my own show was Marion McPartland's producer. And I did Marion's show early in my career. And I walked out you know, when we finished and she walked out of the booth and she said, you should have your own show. She said, you're a natural. And it really, it, it, you know, that thought just sort of stayed with me over the years. And then I thought about so many people have told me and told other musicians because I've talked to them about it. They'll come up after a concert and they'll say, I love jazz or I hate jazz, but I love you. And I know, and you know this as well, that very jazz is very broad. We know that, but a lot of people hear one thing, they don't like it, so they're done with jazz. And I knew a lot of my fans were from other areas of the arts. And I thought if I could get them talking, like a Billy Joel, who I knew, that if I could get them talking about why they love jazz, hopefully somebody would hear that and think, Billy Joel likes jazz, maybe I should give it a chance. So that sort of did that. But in terms of actually getting it going, it was crazy. I went to, a, I had this idea. I started with 13 famous people that I knew liked my music. So I asked them if they'd do this. So I did, it would be a podcast. Recorded these things and went to the public radio conference. I'd never been to a conference. I'd never done anything like that. I, I just... I taught myself how to do it. I listened to feature uh, NPR had done it. Morning Edition had done a feature on me. So I listened to it over and over and taught myself how they <laughs> edited in the music. I thought, oh, that's interesting. They do it this way. And mortgaged my house, got the money. You know, back then you had to pay for satellite uplink. And so I had, that was 10000 a year. And I got a discount because I was an independent uh, so I did that and I mailed it. I mailed CDs. I pressed the CDs and mailed them to stations. And it was sort of like the Judy Garland, Mickey Rooney. I've got a show. <laughs> you know, I've got a, a show. Are you interested? So it, it was, it was very, I'm making light of it, but it was very, very difficult. And I had to raise all the money because then it was a substantial amount of money. Uh, and I did hire someone in the beginning who had worked at NPR so I could sit in the studio and actually watch what he did. And then over the years, I produced produced it in my own way. Because as you say, I was more interested in the human condition. And jazz is my excuse to get into the conversation. I really think you're, I'm sure you're familiar with Krista Tippett, the wonderful Krista Tippett and On Being. I always say my show is On Being, but with a jazz element. <laughs> <laughs> We're really talking about humanity. So that's my goal. Sounds like you almost had to go back to Disneyland to perform to make enough money to produce the podcast. Oh, I did. It was exactly. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, and it was because I did know I created a not for profit. I raised the money. And uh, yeah, and I still do that. I, that's still how I finance it. 2004 interview with Marion McPartland as part of this uh, wonderful book from Judy Carmichael. And Great Inspirations has a number of people, but I want to talk about Marion first, because obviously, not only did you know her because of your ties with NPR and the show and things like that, but you were interviewing somebody who made a name for herself in a male-dominated music scene, and that had to be of major interest to you. It was interesting. It's Although I will tell you that Marion said that she had it much easier than I. And she looked at me with great admiration for how I had done it because Marion was married to someone. And she said Jimmy gave her a lot of protection. And she also came up when jazz was popular. You know, I my, remember my first review said I was the first significant stride player in 30 years. So for me, that means a lot. But at the same time, it shows how insane it was to come out and try to do something. So Marion was... Uh, she was just sort of a charge ahead kind of woman. And we talked about it a bit, but I did ask her about that. And she said there were actually more women around when she was coming up. You think about Hazel Scott and th there was just 
many of them because it was the popular music. So there were not as many as the men, of course, but she was a great person. Just, I so admired her range, which is another reason I didn't want to uh, play on the show. I do every now and then I do, as you know, record on stage and then I will perform with another performer that I'll interview live. But Marion did that so beautifully. She could just play anything. And I told her that. I thought the fact that she could go all the way from playing stride, a uh, stride duet with me and knowing that repertoire to Chick Corea. And there aren't a lot of people that can do that. And so that, the fact that she just kept doing it, I really admired that. One of the things that, I mean, we'll talk about a few more people that you've interviewed in this book because the list is incredible from Tony Bennett, Willie Nelson, Billy Joel, as you mentioned, Marion McPartland, John Batiste, actors like Glenn Close, Robert Redford, Jeff Goldblum, Blythe Danner. So, but if you probably could inject yourself into the Great Day in Harlem photo, would you have had a blast that day, right? Marion, along with all the jazz greats on the steps in Harlem, and you get an opportunity to to have like five questions with each of them. You would have had a blast. <laughs> oh, I would have. And it would just, I mean, getting to know these people. Uh, one of the other great, great gifts of Disneyland for those of us who worked there during the time that I did, and there's quite a few great musicians that have gone on big careers that work there in different bands, not where I worked. And because I had this solo spot, uh, the big bands came in the summer. And so when we were there, so we would get to play our sets and then go hear Basie or Buddy Rich or people like that. And especially for a person like me, being a woman, a lot of the clubs in LA were dangerous. They weren't in good areas. So I got to meet these people in this very safe setting and five nights a week, I could go hear them. And one of you talk about it, it's so funny, asking questions because I did ask Basie because I got to know Count Basie. And one time I asked him, we were alone and this was, on, you know, I'm at the mountain. It's like, there it is, my hero, the one I first heard that made me want to do stride piano. And I said, what is the secret? What is the, the thing that you can tell me? And he said, listen. And I said, yes. And what else? He said, just listen. I said, okay. <laughs> and it which, was such which a great is the day. number one thing to do in an interview so he's actually helped your career in two different ways helped you as and an interviewer in life. And, and, and life and as a pianist exactly and i loved because it was such so so bassy because he was known for that spare style and how every note counted and he didn't need a lot of notes he was the abstract piano player to me and there he said that i thought it was great but you make me think of that with that getting to ask a question so absolutely so i'm going to get to uh more people in your book but since we're on the subject of count basia i wanted to ask you this this is kind of a style that i put into to my show all the time you get to have a panel discussion on jazz inspired, okay? But the guests can only be ones who aren't no longer with us and that you've never had a chance to be around or ask a question to. You get to choose three people on that panel for jazz inspired with Judy Carmichael. Who are the three people? They can be from any walk of life. Who would they be? And I see you have a globe behind you. Where would it be and why? Where would it be? That's it. Where would I like to interview them? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, well, that sort of stumps me because where we interviewed isn't as important to me. Right away, I thought of Nat Cole, who's my all-time favorite pianist. So it'd be Nat Cole and Earl Hines and also somebody I didn't meet. Uh, oh, gosh, I've been so lucky. I've met so many. Um because I was thinking of from different eras, maybe Scott Joplin would be interesting. I just thought of that because I knew Ubi Blake and he was a fascinating character. Or No, no, I take it back. No offense, Scott. Jelly Roll Morton. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so that and where would it be? It'd be interesting because Jelly would want, they'd all want to dominate except for Nat. Um, <laughs> maybe a restaurant. Maybe a restaurant. 
That's what I'm thinking. But I was, um, yeah, because it because Billy had suggest Billy Joel had suggested that for our conversation. So that's a good idea. So we could loosen it up, and so probably il continuare in the city because they've been very good to me and important things have happened there downtown. And it's right around the corner from Knickerbocker where I worked for years. And so then we could go over and maybe play piano. That's okay. So that's my answer. So Jelly Roll Morton, Earl Hines, and Nat Cole. That's a great uh, table to be at. Uh, <laughs> we could all just kind of listen in oh no we're not we're not paying attention to them we're, we're minding our own business but what should we say uh, exactly exactly <laughs> so in this wonderful book Ta-da! jazz inspirations 22 years of jazz inspired on npr the very first interview you include is from 1999 from the uh, incredible actor f murray abraham and uh, i know that he you mentioned in the book that he enjoyed watching you play and coming to watch you play but we were always told right lead with your best so you've led with f murray abraham who was a is a jazz fan and when you think about um his wonderful career why did you decide to choose him as the first interview to include in your book murray is a very deep individual very bright i have a thing for stage actors too, because they're into character. They're not into being a movie star. There's a very different focus. Not that there aren't great movie stars, but he's so bright, so thoughtful, so generous of spirit that, you know, because you've read the book, we did that interview on stage before he was going to perform. And that's an epitome of Murray's attitude about everything. And even meeting him, was hilarious because he was in the restaurant that I was playing at, Knickerbocker. And I was walking in the back on my break and he jumped up and he said, Judy Carmichael, I love you. And he threw his arms around me and I pushed him back. I said, wait, you're F. Murray Abraham. And he said, oh, you know me? <laughs> and it just, it was such a meet cute. And uh, he's just, well, you read it. He He covered all that different ground and he's a great listener he was so much i mean murray had me he invited me to a play years ago a month in the country turgenev on broadway and he said i want you to uh, to see this play he goes not for me i have a very small part but i want you to meet an actress named helen mirren and back then nobody knew here in america people didn't know who helen mirren was unless you saw prime suspect so I'd never heard of her. And I said, oh, I'd love to meet her. That's great. He goes, well, it's really about you seeing her on stage, but you have to come back and meet her. So we're kind of, gen- I mean, you and I know plenty of narcissistic self-centered artists. And here's an actor who's saying, it's not about me. He wanted me personally because of my creativity to be inspired by Helen Mirren. It's a really beautiful story when you think about it. So he's a very special person to me. Have you ever interviewed Michael Shannon? I haven't. I haven't, but I want to. Yeah, because, you know, he's a big fan of WBGO and obviously is a musician as well. Yeah. Uh, and we've uh, had a chance to to talk several times and he's come on to WBGO with Gary Walker in the morning. And um, I remember one time he came on and I said, is this the same guy that put an iron to the face of somebody in Boardwalk Empire? You know, he's played some of the most... <laughs> mean spirited people in the world but you want you you know uh, he was after a broadway show we went backstage and talked to him and we've seen him perform at various venues and to me it's amazing how actors and musicians can turn it on in the moment right and then you meet them and you talk to them i remember i was interviewing anthony rapp he was uh, at nj pack and we were talking about the Chicago Cubs, and he was on my Sports Jam podcast, much like you. We're talking about life with Anthony, and uh, he talks about being a Cubs fan. And moments later, maybe less than an hour later, he's dancing on the tables at NJ Pack doing La Vie Bohem, you know. And I'm like, <laughs> how does how do they do this? Well, you're a performer; you understand what it's like to perform and go from being, hey, 
you know, I'm, I'm talking to somebody, now it's time. So what is that mindset? Tell us a little bit about that transition from being maybe a, a jazz host to a jazz performer. That's a great question because I know when I've done the show on stage, it's very difficult because, I mean, I think I have the kind of brain for it. I have that same brain that can do stride piano and has great hemisphere independence and all that. And I can type and read and talk at the same time. So I've got kind of that ability to do it. But still, I find playing, then talking to the person, then thinking I'm keeping the audience entertained because maybe the person I'm talking to isn't, they're a great musician, but they're not as entertaining. Now I've got to jump up and go play. So they are different parts of your brain, which I talked to Steve Allen about because he was another person who could do so many different things. And I think it's just a focus. I think that it is the ability to, to make that transition. But something that I'll say for our audience, which I think is important for maybe anybody who works in the business in terms of presenting or backstage, we can do this as performers, but we are at a highly sensitized, all our pores are open when we're doing it. And I know that that I had, a, every performer I know has had this happen. I had it happen recently that I was cheerful, we're doing the sound check, loads of things went wrong, I stayed happy, I kept my musicians together, they were getting cranky, I'm playing, my hands are all the, my hands are cold, all this is happening. But then the person who was supposed to bring the food didn't. And that was the thing that was like the deal breaker for me, to where it just all, I said, because I was doing, I was juggling so many things. And they hadn't taken care of this tiny little job that they had, which was deliver the food. And now I was looking at the musicians who were hungry. We wouldn't, you know, and I think that performers, professional performers make this all look very, the great ones make it all look very easy, but underneath a lot is happening. And I think that that support people around them have to realize, okay, they're working on, you know, uh, a million miles an hour. We need to take care of our jobs too. That's my little advocacy for that kind of understanding. But I think that it's it's what we do and we're good at separating um, those different things in our mind. I will tell you, it's interesting because I've had a lot of actors on the show. Very often actors are shy and they don't want to do, they don't want to go on stage and do a cabaret show or something like that. I mean, some do, and there a lot of them aren't very good because they think that this is something they can just do, but it's a very different thing to walk on stage and be in front of people and be yourself and do a show as opposed to having a character that you are inhabiting. So I've had a lot of actors talk about that. That's interesting. It's an interesting shift. Again, the book is... Great Inspirations, 22 Years of Jazz Inspired on NPR. And we're speaking with Judy Carmichael. You may be uh, surprised to know, or maybe not, that what I found fascinating about your book, even more than the interviews themselves, are the way you get into the presentation of how it all came about. Because I love history, and knowing your connections with each of these individuals and what you were thinking before you went into the interview and like Jeff Goldblum, am I, you know, is he going to be too off the wall kind of, is he going to focus on, on, you know, other things? And let's say if you would have interviewed Robin Williams at the time, I mean, how, how you never know where he's going to take an interview or something like that. So it's a tough job that, that you do interviewing people like that. So who through the years and doesn't even have to be someone in the book was either surprised you the most, or you went, this was a mistake. <laughs> well, thank you, number one. I'm so pleased because I thought that was interesting and I thought it was different, you know, because you have your own interviews that we don't have a huge staff writing out the questions for us, nor do we want that. We actually like to think that our conversations are unique because we're the ones asking the questions. So I appreciate that. And the fact that I didn't have a big network behind me, I had to go after all these people and that I find that a very interesting story with that. I've, in the beginning, I had, I thought, 
and I think I said this in the book that E.L. Doctorow, who is also became a friend, uh, was a friend and was one of my original 13. He said, have you noticed that you only have old white guys on the show? Because I, <laughs> I I chose 13 old white guys and they were like, they were all famous. They were smart. They were interesting, articulate. I said, oh my God, all I know were old white guys. So then I made the foolish decision to go after people who were young. That was my motivation. Had they done something interesting? Was their music um, good? And they were young. And there were a couple, they were just tremendously, profoundly boring, not prepared, not interesting. I wound up not using the interviews. And um, also, so that was a lesson. Also, I did a couple favors where people were enthusiastic, publicists were enthusiastic, and those weren't good. And that's when I thought, no, I have a good sense of the people I want, and I'm asking people who I suspect have a bigger view of life, that it's not just about pro promoting their, their product, because that I, that I wanted the show to be different because I saw where it had gone in my career. I was lucky when I started, they were still doing shows about interesting people who had a unique story. That all stopped. You and I know it's all about promoting something. And I thought, no, I want to have people on that have an interesting life and will be excited about talking about the bigger picture and inspiration, what inspires them. So I guess the biggest surprise, one of, I'll tell you a big, you mentioned Jeff Goldblum. Uh, I knew he'd be charming. I mean, he's professionally charming. This is one of the most charming people in life, but he was really prepared. And that was, he had researched me. He had, he came in, he was extremely humble, uh, very grateful. I've heard from him since. He thanked me for the interview, wanted to work together. It was, so I found, I'm not surprised by it as much anymore. The really, the, the very, very, very famous people accomplished are what I call old school professionals. They are there to make the interview great. They're present, they're involved, they're engaged. And if they haven't heard of me, they've checked me out. And then by the time they get there, they, and they want to talk about it, which is the other thing. They're not just completely self-involved. They want to, they start asking me questions and I've got to <laughs> cut it out because it's about them, you know? I mean, it'll go back and forth, but you know what I mean? So the biggest, I had somebody on, I don't want to name them because they're quite famous and it didn't, I had to really work hard at making it work, which surprised me because I really liked their art, but I've had some people in their early twenties that I fear for Doug that are already burned out and I can mm. see it. And I remember that age and, you know, when everything hit and I got all the big, you know, entertainment tonight did a piece on me. I got a lot of attention. I was nervous, but I was never burned out. And these people seem like they're 45 road hard and put away wet and they're in their early twenties. So I'm, that's been something that's been happening lately with a few people. And that, that concerns me. We have a few minutes left here in this uh, wonderful interview with Judy Carmichael. I wanted to mention to you a couple of things that happened to me. Um, uh, Frank Sinatra Jr. came into the radio station and I asked Gary Walker, and it was talking about his music with Sammy Kahn. And I said, Gary, what should be my lead off question for Frank Jr.? And he said, ask him about his dad's relationship with Sammy Kahn. So thank goodness it was a taped interview, Judy, because the first question was, tell me about your dad's relationship with Sammy Kahn and the music. I'm not here to talk about Mr. Sinatra. <laughs> I could have told you that. <laughs> right. And and so right away I had to adjust, right. And, and do a whole different interview. And it was funny because he called back and said, you know, that was a great interview. Well, of course, because all we talked about was you. We weren't allowed to talk about Mr. Sinatra, your father. So that one won. And, and another one, that that, uh, that Gary is also involved with. And he said, you know, Doug, you should interview Monty Alexander about boxing. 
and this was a few years ago. We've all, <laughs> and we've already had Monty back on the show. He wanted to come back because he had more to talk about. So the, my first question to Monty was, and I was like, you know, am, am I an aficionado when it comes to, you know, music, you know, his, his style of music? And do I know enough about boxing to do this interview with Monty? And the first question was, Monty, do you remember the first time you saw a, a boxing match? He goes, oh, done. I was in Kingston, Jamaica, and there he was. It was Sugar Ray Robinson, and he was on the canvas, <laughs> and the lights were shining down, and the mosquitoes, and you could see him, and there he was. And I was like, this will be the greatest interview I've ever done. I don't even have to ask oh, a question. Yeah. He just painted the picture <laughs> of being a kid and watching one of the greatest boxers of all time. Aww. I knew I was in good shape, and uh, he's since been on the show again. And uh, as you can attest to, you know, one of our greatest piano players ever. So, I, oh, he's I, amazing. When you did, you mentioned Billy Joel a lot. I, I wanted to ask you about ask you a little bit about Billy Joel, and, and then get to John Batiste real quickly. Uh, and that's another beautiful thing about this book is that it covers such a range of time. As you mentioned, these twenty two years uh, for Billy Joel. Um, you mentioned that you know you've be, you've become friends. He's been able to last this this lasting that, that young people still enjoy his music. And he's and when you listen to his show on the radio, he's so knowledgeable about you know all kinds of music, including jazz and things like that. He truly is um, uh, just a really unique guy, isn't he? I think he is, and I think his music has lasted because it's built it it's substantive, and. I can't imagine anybody else. I told him this too. It was funny because I bumped into him not long ago out here because we live near each other. And I talked about playing the garden so much. And he sort of made some humble thing. I said, stop. He goes, okay, it's a, he said, it's a good gig. But I can't imagine anybody else who could play the garden that often. Taylor Swift, lover. She couldn't play as free once a month or however often he was doing it. He's his music has substance. And so it does continue to appeal. It appeals to the people who came up with it. It appeals to young people. He's natural on stage. He is so bright and he really cares. There's he's somehow lived as this iconic figure, gone through loads of ups and downs. And he still cares about the music. He loves the music. And that sounds obvious, but I think a lot of people, we come back to Basie and listening. A lot of people aren't listening to their music anymore. It's easy to be excited when you're young, but Billy's still excited about it and still always asks what I'm doing. You know, it's, uh, he cares and he's involved. He's a special guy. I really like Billy a lot. How about one minute on John Batiste? He went from, you know, just being a, uh, a side guy on a, a TV show. But, I mean, everybody knew his talent, but then he exploded on the scene and he's one of your interviews in this book. What do you want to say about John Batiste? Same thing. He, I mean, he's younger, of course, but he's so, so excited. He is just what he seems. That was a surprise, I have to say. I mean, I knew he'd be great. I knew he'd be engaged, all of that, but he charged into the room and just you know, was just right on time another thing the famous people were always on time they uh but just oozed all this excitement and musicality and i played him a few bars i said so and so said i need to play a few bars and he went insane he ran over he was so excited and then i said we have to we have to do the interview <laughs> you know had to calm him down and then he jumped up and ran over to the piano again and wanted to show me all the things no he's just He'll last because another, again, he cares. He's enthusiastic about the music. He has a great background. It isn't just somebody who got famous and had nothing to back it up. He has so much. So his, I want to say the armature, the, the psychological and musical and emotional armature of somebody like a Billy Joel and a John Batiste is extremely strong because it has been built bit by bit by bit even though it seems like whoosh, they went right up, they have a solid base that keeps them going. And I that really counts, really counts. Love him. From Robert Redford, 
talk about being intimidated maybe by anybody that you've interviewed. I think if I interviewed Glenn Close, I might be a little bit intimidated because I certainly wouldn't want to have dinner with her in a pot, you know, uh, on the stove. <laughs> with uh, any rabbits around? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there, there oh are some God. people that, that are intimidating. We just have a, a, a few minutes left. Is there anybody that you were starstruck from or yeah. intimidated by? Yeah, um, I was Redford. Robert Redford, because he's been a big figure my entire life. My brother looks a lot like Robert Redford, even before I knew who Robert Redford was. My older brother, people say, oh, your brother, you know. So it wasn't like I was attracted to him like so many people of my generation or something. I was into Redford because of his films always having a point of view to make the world a better place very often. And, you know, downhill racer, he was always an environmentalist. He cares about the same things I care about. And when he was 40, when he could have just made lots more movies as a handsome leading man, he directed uh, ordinary people that, I mean, so deep, everything, he, you know, these things are so deep. He bought Sundance. He, people don't even remember anymore what he did for independent film. So when I got there, um, I, he hired me actually to be, to play as part of the Sundance Festival. And I had a moment of kind of a little freak out. I admit I got there. I was at the actual Sundance, not Park City. And it was uh, so beautiful with Shangri-La. And I thought, oh, he's done so much. And, you know, I have I done enough in my life? I actually called a friend of mine and said, I'm having a little bit of a freak out. And she's, I, she said, why? I said, he's just done so much and he's put out so much good into the world. I don't feel I've done enough. And she said, he's older than you. You have time. <laughs> and, it, and it made me laugh. And it brought me back to earth. And then we really hit it off. And it wound up that all the things that I thought we had in common, we did. We became friends. He's hired me for a number of other things. And he is just a stellar human being. And how, I just have to say this, I know we're running out of time, but I'm so admiring of people who put good into the world. And somebody like a Robert Redford, who is so beautiful looking and is surrounded by the Hollywood infrastructure that says, be self-centered, be narcissistic, don't care about anybody but you. And he somehow managed to still care about everybody else and put so much good. No, he's, he's just a very high level of human being. And I was really, that's one of my very favorites um, in, in the whole time of doing the show. You'll have to read that interview and much more. Judy Carmichael's new book, Great Inspirations, 22 Years of Jazz Inspired on NPR and the Good News, still going strong. Judy, great <laughs> to have you on the show and great to laugh with you. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me. Thank you.